Hey everyone, welcome to another video on the channel. Today, I thought we'd do something a little bit different, and instead of talking about a particular stock, I thought I would just talk about uh, a play I think is an absolute no-brainer, which is playing the energy stocks, generally speaking. So, you know, a lot of people have been down on energy recently, and as far as I can tell, the two big reasons why the people that are bearish on energy are bearish, it's because A, they think that A, recession is either here or coming, and so therefore demand is going to fall off a cliff. And secondarily, because energy is often cyclical, and so we've often seen in the summer that oil prices will go on a on a mad tear and then during winter it'll calm back down. These are basically the uh, reasons why I think the people that are bearish uh, often say that they are bearish and personally I couldn't disagree more with this analysis and I'm going to tell you why. Now before I get into this of course this is not financial advice this is just for education and entertainment purposes only but that being said, I think one thing to keep in mind first and foremost is what does Wall Street think of energy? Because, you know, there's really uh, several different uh, methodologies or mindsets when you're investing. Some people think they're going to outsmart the smart money, like in a AMC or meme stock, GameStop type of situation. Personally, I think this is rather foolhardy. I think it makes way more sense to figure out where the smart money is putting all their money and see if you could jump on board and get some of those gains also. And one thing we know for sure is that Wall Street has been bullish on energy this entire year of 2022, and they're still bullish. They're just as bullish as they ever were, maybe even more so. Now, let's get into this as to why because I feel like there's so many different factors uh, to touch upon. But so this article talks about a poll of 814 retail and portfolio investors, risk managers, etc. Although, uh, keep it with a grain of salt, it's including uh, retail, so that's not necessarily smart money, but risk managers, buy side, sell side trade, whatever. Okay, so they did a poll of all these people and you know, what is the sentiment? The sentiment is that uh, energy is still as bullish as ever for various factors. First and foremost, supply constraints, which, you know, really haven't been factored in enough. A lot of people are counting on demand falling, but what about supply? And we know there's a ton of issues with supply, a ton. So, Obviously, Russia is a big one. The fact that coming on December 5th, Europe is going to stop all of its uh, energy imports from Russia. Now, I know they've been talking about this for a while, but they are to this day, they're still importing energy from Russia. But guess what? That's all going to end. That's all going to end soon and right before winter. Now, uh, and obviously that... I think will have a bullish uh, impact on the price because then they're going to have to import their oil from someone else that's not Gazprom. You know, they're going to have to import oil from these other companies that are going to have to ship it on tankers and they're going to end up paying way more for it. All of these European um, countries that are importing it. So that I don't think has really been uh, factored in. Um, and then I really like this guy, Jeff Curry. Uh, if you've ever uh, heard him speak or listened uh, or read any of his comments, I, I think he, I mean, he's super bullish on oil and he has been all year. But I think he brings up another good point, which is there's been a total lack of investment in the energy sector over the past years. And he basically says that you're not going to, solve this supply demand there's a total imbalance in the whole supply demand right now in terms of uh, the amount of spare capacity 
is low. It's like the lowest on record. So you'd think that the price would be the highest, you know, or up there, and it hasn't. It's been falling off. And so there's a total disconnect, and that's furthermore elaborated over here. Saudi Arabia's energy minister, somebody that knows a lot about the energy markets, pointed to the, quote, disconnect between the paper and physical markets, saying that OPEC Plus was ready to cut production at any time in any form if it believes it would bring stability to the, quote, schizophrenic oil market. Because it's true, the oil market doesn't doesn't really make sense from a supply demand. But you could bet, you could bet that Saudi Arabia and these OPEC countries, they don't want oil prices to drop. You think they're just going to watch and let it drop? They're just going to cut. They're going to cut, 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 cut as much as they possibly have to in order to you know, keep prices high. And so they could, you know, continue to uh, profit off higher energy prices. And again, they're already doing it. I mean, we're not speculating on what they might do. They're doing it right now. So as we're seeing, this was from just the other day. You know, it's been in the news over over the past months over and over, like another cut, another cut. And now here we are, November 17th, Saudi Arabia is cutting oil exports again, and by 430,000 barrels per day. That is no small cut. That's a substantial cut. So, you know, what's the likelihood of what's going to happen? You know, it's Russia is going to turn off their supply to Europe. I mean, they're going to keep on trying to supply China and India and these other countries, but it's still not going to generate as much oil on and natural gas on the global market. And Saudi Arabia and these other countries are going to cut. See, and now, so Saudi Arabia has started to slash its crude exports so after OPEC Plus is now reducing its overall target production by 2 million barrels per day. So that's OPEC Plus is by 2 million barrels per day. That's a lot of cutting that they're doing, <clears throat> and it doesn't end there. I mean, here's just more of, of the same in terms of what we're hinging upon, uh, in terms of what we were just discussing. And it's interesting that they're, they are speculating that demand will decline. So they're trimming growth in 2022, uh, in 2023 by 100,000 barrels per day, but what did we just say? They're, so demand trims by 100,000 barrels per day. How much are they cutting? Are they cutting 100,000 barrels? No, they're cutting 430,000 barrels per day. I mean, so immediately we have a supply demand, uh, you know, disjointment over here, which I think could only really result in increased prices for the barrels that they are releasing onto the, the market. So oil demand in 2022 will increase by 2.55 million barrels or 2.6, down 100,000, what they're saying. Their uh, world economy has entered significant uncertainty. Obviously, you know, <laughs> everyone knows that. And I want to delve a little deeper into some of these other reasons why uh, oil is and um, energy generally, um, I think really is uh, a no-brainer. Um, and a lot of it, I like this article. So it points out the fact that, yeah, prices have fallen 33% since the summer. And this is actually from last month, so, you know, around even more probably, but it's still high. I mean, over the summer, it was, what, like $120 plus. So the fact that it's fallen, I mean, it's still at an elevated level. And what I like that this article also discusses is, if I could find it here, the fact that we're in a recession doesn't necessarily mean oil is going to fall off a cliff or the fact that we may be entering a recession as they say, recessions do not always result in negative oil demand and can equally lead to only a moderation in the rate of demand growth. And now he refers back to the global COVID-19 recession when we were in locked in our homes, not driving for weeks, 
and only military and cargo planes were flying, and yet oil demand only fell by about 8%. That's a remarkable figure. Think about what that just said. So back in COVID, all like passenger flights were basically, you know, I mean, they weren't all shut down, but greatly reduced, greatly reduced. People weren't driving to work or driving their cars any places. Everyone was self-isolating. And yet oil demand only fell by about 8%. Not that big of a fall considering those factors. And then when you look historically, so back the recession of 2009, if you could remember that, you know, the whole financial system was in utter turmoil. And yet there was only a moderate decline of 2%. In oil demand. And back in 2001 and 1991, there was actually positive oil demand growth. So why wouldn't that happen again? You know, there could be positive oil demand growth even, even if we go into a recession. Or if there is a decline, it might be, uh, you know, more in line with the COVID decline, which is only 8%, or the 2009 decline, which is also uh, more minimal. So something to keep in mind. And also the fact that we haven't even talked about China. I mean, China, if China comes back online, think of all the energy that they're going to consume. I mean, and and who knows what will happen. We're entering winter and there is a good chance China will continue their uh, lockdown policy, which would, you know, mitigate demand somewhat. But, you know, China's been in lockdown and there's still oil prices have still been high and they'll probably continue to continue to be high. So, oh, and here's another thing. Europe, too, is switching from to oil from natural gas as the whole Russia situation plays out, which is also going to put a strain on oil prices in particular. And who's going to benefit from that? It's going to be like the United States and Canada and these other uh, countries, oil companies, most likely. Now, I really do want to focus on Russia because I feel like there's no getting around uh, talking it at some length. Um, So why don't you listen to this? This is from Peter Zion, who's like a geopolitical demographer. Uh, who has some interesting commentary, but I thought this was interesting. Why don't we give a a quick listen concerning Russia? The Russian oil patch isn't like Texas. It's in the permafrost. If ports can't disgorge cargo, pressure builds up in the ports all the way back to the pipes, all the way to the wells in Siberia. And then the oil freezes in the pipes as it goes through the permafrost. The water that comes up as a byproduct turns to ice, and when water turns to ice, it expands and it busts the pipe from the inside out. The last time this happened in Russia was 1992, and it took the Russians 30 years to bring it all back online. Only it wasn't the Russians who brought it back online. It was the Western services firms operating in Russia, which are now almost completely gone. So all we need is one or two events with shipping or with insurance, and we lose about 4 million barrels a day of Russian crude all at once. The pricing for oil and for fuels and electricity does not follow normal supply and demand. So I just thought I would uh, bring that out. And here on the map, you could see, yeah, I mean, if you look uh, to the base of where these pipes are coming. They're all coming from the very north of Russia around the the Arctic Circle over here is where they're getting all of that oil and natural gas, or a lot of it, and then they're just piping it, piping it, piping it into Europe. So, you know, that's a very, very real possibility that there will be an issue concern if they do cut off the oil and gas, which they're doing, as I said, on December 5th, How are they going to restart that? What if, you know, because there's no oil or gas flowing through these pipes, what if they freeze? I mean, it could take, it could just burst the pipes. I mean, and then it'll take years and years for them to go back online. So, you know, I don't know how, to what extent uh, Wall Street or even the retail investors are factoring 
that sort of challenge in, because I think it is a big challenge. And keeping on this topic of Wall Street, I mean, I don't think it's an accident. Obviously, this has made a lot of news over the past months that Warren Buffett just keeps on buying, I mean, Occidental stock and also Chevron is another one of his favorites. So uh, I, I just feel like it's one of these situations where, you know, a lot of people who are negative on oil, I have a feeling that Warren Buffett is going to be right and end up making a ton of money. And all those people that are saying, oh, no, oil is going to fall off a cliff, yada, yada, yada. I feel like they're going to be wrong and Warren Buffett's going to be right. Just my guess, you know, but it goes back to what I said at the beginning. Do you want to, you know, follow the smart money and try to make some of that money? Or do you want to bet against Warren Buffett and, you know, keep your fingers crossed and hopefully he'll be wrong and you'll be able to make some money? So, I mean, just all things to consider. Uh, Again, nobody knows what's going to happen in the future. Uh, There could be a a big uh, shock to the market. Maybe the market has already factored this in and will be able to adjust. No one really knows. But keeping on uh, this whole idea, well, let's look specifically at Occidental, though, because obviously 2022 has been a tough year for everyone. But, uh, you know, one thing that's done really well, obviously, being energy, uh, has outperformed everything pretty much or maybe utility now, probably everything. Let's look. This is the one-year chart for Occidental. And look at that. Have you seen something so beautiful in a while? I mean, the stock has doubled over the past year. Can you think of many other plays that have doubled over this horrible year for the market? I mean, not too many. So... Just something to keep in mind. Personally, I think energy is a no-brainer. However you want to play it, if you want to buy individual energy stocks, if you want to buy XLE, you want to buy some of these ETFs, there's a million different ways to to play it. But personally, I'm very bullish on energy um, for the rest of 2022 and definitely into 2023. I think we're just going to see these trends continue. So... But, I mean, I'm not a financial advisor, of course. This is just for education and entertainment purposes. But let me know what you think. Do you think that energy is about to roll over? Do you think that energy is going to go to all-time highs? Uh, Let me know what you think in the comments section. And don't forget to leave a like and a comment. And uh, say hello on Twitter. And I'll catch you in the next one.